his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace.
Father God, Lord, we worship you today. Lord, help us to hold on to the truth of who you are, that you are powerful, that you are wonderful, that nothing compares to you. Nothing that we could seek here on this earth can ever fill what you can fill in our lives, Lord. And in this season, Lord, as we head into this beautiful Christmas season, Lord, help us to keep our focus on you. If we want joy, we'll find it in you. If we wanna know what real love is, we'll find it in you. So Father, as we, as we just head into this time of joy and giving, Lord, help us to remember it is all about you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, and help us to love you more each and every day. In your precious, most holy name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, hey, New Life family, it's so great to be back with you again this weekend. We hope you had an amazing Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I'm still having to ask forgiveness uh, for what I did to my body uh, for about three days during the Thanksgiving holiday. So hopefully uh, you had an amazing Thanksgiving, spending time with family. You got to eat all you want. And uh, we are preparing for the holiday season as we come into the Christmas holiday. Hey, if you haven't taken advantage yet of... Uh, any particular year during uh, during the holiday season, during the Christmas season, to take advantage of a an Advent reading plan, I want to encourage you to do so. Okay, so we have one available uh, here at New Life, and there's also a lot of plans available if you go to the YouVersion Bible app. Just all you have to do, just go to the search en engine and just put in uh, Advent, and there'll be just a ton of different reading plans. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of an Advent reading plan that we have available uh, through New Life or through the Bible app, okay, because they're amazing. All right, Advent means an expectancy of, 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 of coming. And so uh, if you look and do some research of the Advent, it is uh, in preparation or an expectation of the coming King, Jesus being born. But if you dig around a little deeper and do some more research on the Advent, you'll see that it's also preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? It's great to prepare uh, our, our hearts and our minds for the first coming, which, which is why we celebrate Christmas and we've connected Advent to Christmas, but I think we can also connect it to the second coming, which I don't believe is too far away, so just want to encourage you uh, to do that as well, okay? So, uh, but we just wanted to say happy, uh, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas to you. Go ahead and take out your phones, connect with someone uh, with whom you haven't seen in a while, and check in on them. Okay, not just to wish them a Merry Christmas or a Happy Holidays or the Happy Thanksgiving, but also to check in on them because 2020 has been a crazy year and we know that uh, depression and things like that have been through the roof because of this year and we need to check in on each other and hold each other accountable and so make sure you do that, okay? While you're at it, go ahead and uh, download the sermon notes so you can just connect with the sermon notes. If you go to the if you go to the New Life app and then go down to the right-hand corner, you'll see the word connect. Click on that and then go to resources there at the top and then you'll see sermon notes and then click on today's date um, as we kick off um, a brand new uh, series this weekend called The Hope of the World. Also, today is the first weekend of the month, so we're going to be participating and taking communion together as a faith family. So anytime during this message, if you need to hit pause or you need to uh, uh, quiet the kids down or whatever and go get your communion elements, we're going to be doing that later during the message, okay? So between points one and two, we're going to be uh, taking communion, so we can't wait to do that um, as a faith family together. If you have any prayer needs, make sure that you text the word prayer to 30500. Get those prayers in. We're going to be praying for you during this, uh, during this Christmas season. Uh, don't forget to take advantage of all the resources that we have available to you. Go to our website, newlifecc.com. We have resources for kids and students and life groups and growth track. All of those things are on there available to you, so we want you to take advantage of those as well. Okay. Now, the key verse that we are going to be uh, diving into throughout this entire series, this Christmas series, is found in the book of Romans. This is the letter, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. And in chapter 15, verse 13, we read this. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. What a year this has been, right? A pandemic, uh, unprecedented division in our country, elections and lawsuits and recounts, riots and polarized conversations and perspectives, prophecies and conspiracy theories, fears and anxieties, masks and vaccines, colors for counties and curfews here in California, shutdowns and reopenings, sports with cardboard fans and piped in fake crowd noises. All right, that drives me crazy. I've seen one NFL game this year because I just can't do it. I I can't stand seeing the empty stadium, okay? Dogs and cats actually liking each other, saved by the bell, threatening to do a comeback. I mean, this has been a terrible year. And it's just going to keep getting worse sometimes when I see all these things trying to happen. And yet right in the middle of this Category 5 hurricane that we seem to be in culturally, Right in the center stands Jesus. He's calm. He's peaceful. He's in total control. The very existence of Christ standing there says, I am hope. He's always been the hope of the world. He always will be the hope of the world. It seemed like only a month ago. It seemed like a a month ago that we began this crazy 2020 journey, but here we are. It's almost Christmas time again. Can you believe it? We've been doing online services for over eight months now. It's hard to believe, but yet here we are. And one of my all-time favorite Christmas movies is It's a Wonderful Life. In fact, that movie is so good, it's so rich for my soul that I actually watched it back in July because I needed it. I needed to, uh, to embrace just the richness of that movie for it because it is really, it's a lot of nourishment for me. And one of my favorite lines in the movie comes right near the beginning, okay? It's between Clarence and his boss. All right, he's up in heaven. You see the stars kind of talking to each other. Here's Clarence, second class, angel second class, is about to get his assignment from his boss to go help this guy who's in trouble. And his boss says to him, you've got to go help this guy named George Bailey. And Clarence says, uh, what is it? Is he sick? And I love the response when he asks, is he sick? His boss says, no, it's worse than that. He's discouraged. I love that line because discouragement, this this lack of hope can be worse than a physical illness. Discouragement. There's around 325 million people in the United States. I wonder how many would consider themselves discouraged today if we were to ask them. I don't think it would surprise any of us the astronomical number that that would be because of everything that's happening in our country right now. The human spirit needs hope to survive and to thrive, don't we? One expert says it this way, Since my early years as a physician, I've learned for most people that taking away hope is like pronouncing a death sentence. A person's already hard-pressed will to live can become paralyzed, and they may even give up and die. Well, the writers of our scripture knew this as well. They recognized our need for hope more than 2,500 years ago. Look uh, in in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart, what? Sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. It's not surprising that if God created human beings with this craving for hope, it would make sense that he would also offer to us an ultimate hope. Romans 15 Verse 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. This is our theme verse, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There are nearly 200 references to this word hope in our scriptures, in our Bible. Spread out pretty evenly between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This consistent theme of hope is woven all throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end. And it's going to be our theme as we dive into the Christmas season this weekend and into the new year. Now, whether or not you are a follower of Jesus today, we know that we're all searching for hope. 
it's pretty easy to find. And not, not that hope is easy to find, but it's pretty easy to see that humanity is longing for hope. I believe all of humanity, especially in the times that we're in now, is being drawn to a deeper connection to hope. The challenge is if you're not following, following Jesus this weekend, hope's going to be a little harder for you to find. My prayer is that for those of you who have not made that decision yet to become a follower of Jesus Christ, that when you do find hope, you're also going to find Jesus. So be open to that. Because Jesus is hope. Jesus cannot be separated from hope because hope is one of the attributes that make up who he is. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the savior of the world. He's the answer for the world. And he is the hope for the world. We need for hope. We are desperate for hope. Without hope, what else is there? People, uh, people who are hopeless are miserable. Hope comes from God, and God offers a hope so powerful that it can transform a human life's, a human means life. It can rewrite a person's eternity. Hope can do that. Jesus is even referred to as hope several times throughout Scripture. In the book of Titus, found in the New Testament, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, I just want to give a shout out to the McNair family who used to be part of the Patterson campus. They now live in North Carolina. And I never will forget, the very first time that I ever read from the book of Titus, uh, Todd and Gabby were pregnant with their first child, and they just found out that it was a boy. And when I read from the book of Titus, he said, that's the name of our son, Titus. So, hey, just want to say hey to Todd and Gabby and Titus out there in North Carolina. It says this in, chat, in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for what? The blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, it's not the kind of hope that we normally think of when we use the word hope as humanity. In everyday conversations, we use the word hope sort of flippantly, don't we, in various ways uh, that we aren't really uh, on the same track with what the Bible is referring to uh, when the Bible talks about hope. Okay, for instance, sometimes uh, we talk about hope and what we really are meaning is more of wishful thinking. We say we hope for something, but we're actually... uh, Uh, thinking in a wishful manner that that does or does not happen. Wishful thinking is when we try to hope for things in or out of existence. I hope we can someday get back to normalcy. I hope 2021 is nothing like 2020. I hope we can go through the holidays and not gain uh, another 10 pounds and add to the quarantine 19 that, 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 that Jeremy has gained. Wishful thinking is that kind of hopeful feeling that somehow, some way, Things are going to go the way that we want them to go. Even though we have absolutely no control over the situation, we have no power over what happens, it's wishful thinking, but we use the word hope. Sometimes when we uh, engage in wishful thinking deeply enough, we can actually convince ourselves that something is true even when it's not. That's the power of wishful thinking. Now, there's another type of hopeful attitude called blind optimism. Blind optimism. I think it's great to be an optimistic person. I tend to be very optimistic, but sometimes I go a little too far. The Patterson team will attest to this. You know, Anna and Tito will tell you that sometimes Jeremy has the tendency to be overly optimistic, okay, which is actually kind of dangerous for someone of my personality because uh, when we're overly optimistic all the time, then we have blinders on to reality, Or when someone's trying to uh, sit down and confess some of their hurts and habits and hang-ups that CR teaches us to address. Sometimes people with my personality who are overly optimistic can minimize those. And that's not that we do it on purpose. I have to force myself not to look away when there's pain and ugliness and injustice in the world. Everything is just fine all the time to me and people like me with my personality. In fact, some religions take this approach. They take it too far. They say that some, some Christian scientists actually say that all evil ultimately is just an illusion. That evil is not real. That evil is something that we as humanity are just imagining. And we know that's not true. 
People living in a place of blind optimism will pretend that things are great when they are not. This is not biblical hope. Now let me contrast wishful thinking and blind optimism with biblical hope. For most people, hoping is something that they do. But the Bible talks about hope as something that we can have. It's something that we can live. You see the difference there? You and I can possess hope. We can own hope. We can grab a hold of hope. We can be hope because of what Christ has done in us. If you're a follower of Jesus this weekend, here's the definition of hope. Hope is the confident expectation that God is willing and able to fulfill the promises that he has made to you. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have that hope yet. Now, you can Have that hope. You can possess that hope. You can own that hope by accepting Christ as your Savior. This definition is for followers of Jesus. Hope is the confident expectation that God is willing and able to fulfill the promises that he has made to you. The Bible refers to this kind of hope as living hope because it's always linked to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Imagine living in the promises that God has made for you and your life. And that takes us to our first fill-in for the weekend. You have it in your notes there digitally. Number one, the hope of Jesus offers me new beginnings. The hope of Jesus offers me new beginnings. Look at the book of Lamentations found in the Old Testament, chapter 3. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. By his mercies we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. His mercies begin afresh each day. The writer here, the prophet Jeremiah, is teaching us that we can live in hope as followers of Jesus Christ because even though we may fail God, which we all do, Even though we may fail some of our friends, which we all do. Even though we may fail our spouse and our children, which we all do. God's compassion and forgiveness for those wrongs we've done in our past is a renewable resource. It's renewable. God's love and compassion never run out. It's an extended warranty to humanity that renews every single day without getting those annoying phone calls. All right? About your extended warranty about to expire. Okay, hopefully I'm not the only ones. I've been getting the last chance to, uh, to, to commit to my extended warranty for over 18 months now, and I know you probably are getting those same phone calls. But God's love and his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy is never exhausted. It's never expired. It is fresh, and it's available to us to access all the time. Did you know, in fact, that our church logo is based on this premise, that God is in the process every day of making us brand new? In fact, our image of the arrow with the circle was taken from the recycling images that we see around town because that's the business God is in, taking the old and making us new, constantly recycling us. Thank God for that. Growing up in Tennessee, uh, all of the neighborhood boys would come over to my house after school. It was easy access. And, uh, we all walked home from school, and our, we lived just right down from the school. And so after school, the, uh, all the neighborhood boys would come over to my house, and we'd play football in my side yard. So every day there'd be backpacks and clothes all over the place. Even one of our teachers would stop uh, every now and then, and he would be the quarterback for both sides. It was amazing memories. But there was something that happened because there was a a busy road in front of my house. Lots of traffic. And when that football would go into the road, we said, time out, stop. We stopped the game. We stopped the play. And we said, do over. Ball in the road. Do over, which happened all the time. Listen, some of you need a do over from God this weekend because of your guilt. And guess what? You get that. We get to do it over because God's constantly recycling us. You see, our guilt lies to us and says, you're disqualified from a do-over. But that's not true. That's a lie from the enemy. We hear the, the lies that say, you don't deserve a clean slate. 
what you did is worse than what this person did, so you don't deserve a do-over. You don't deserve to, to start over. And God says those are lies. You do. You get a do-over. Guilt squeezes hope from our lives, but Jesus died to overcome our guilt. This is the perfect season to ask God for a do-over. Think about this. When Christ came, our entire world was in need, a desperate need of a do-over. In the beginning, God created a perfect world, a masterful creation. It was beautiful. It was creative. I mean, the whole thing. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden of this creation to take care of it, to nurture it, to cultivate it. And then Adam and Eve opened the door to sin and pain and suffering and death and disease. And then Jesus came thousands of years later, the, the second Adam, because he was the one to usher in the new kingdom and the new creation. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling weighed down by guilt in your life this weekend, maybe because of the way that you treated your kids as they were growing up, you weren't the best parent. You have a failed marriage because you weren't the best spouse. You've cheated your boss or your company. you treated your employees poorly. The way you treated others due to the pandemic or because of the election, whatever it is. Why would you want to lug around this backpack of guilt for a whole for a whole nother year. Another 365 more days of being weighed down by guilt and God is saying, my mercies are fresh every day. Come to me, all of you who are weak and carry heavy burdens. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this, but if we confess our sins to him, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. Not just so many, not just these wrongs. Doesn't give a list of these wrongs and not these wrongs. No, of every wrong. The question is, will you? Will you confess your sins to God so that he can be faithful and just to forgive you? What better time than right now as we enter a time of new beginnings to say, Heavenly Father, this Christmas, you are going to be my anchor that we're going to be talking about next week. You are going to be the one from whom I draw my security and my hope. God never changes. He, he never disappoints. He is there for us every single day. God is the God of do-overs. Imagine living that this Christmas. So speaking of do-overs, go ahead and grab your uh, communion elements. I have mine right over here. Like we said earlier, this is the first weekend of the month, and we always like to uh, take communion and just participate in the Lord's Supper, the last, uh, the last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the first Sunday of the week. So I'm stalling just a little bit because I want to make sure you, that everyone's ready, kind of gets their stuff together. I think what better, what better season to start fresh? And here's what I want to do first. There's scripture that talks about making sure that there's nothing between us and God. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning or this weekend, scripture says that to make sure that there's nothing between us and God before we take the elements. So I want to pause just for, just for a few seconds and give us time to really search our lives and search our hearts, search our thoughts, and to make sure that there's nothing between us and God before we take these elements. So let's do that right now. Father, I ask that if there's anything in my life, anything in my thought life, anything in my actions, Lord, any bitterness or jealousy or gossip or lust or anything, Lord, in my life, Lord, cleanse me of that right now before I take these elements in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and take your wafer. Represents the body of Christ, broken for our sin. The sinless body of Christ was sacrificed. The sinless body of Jesus was broken. The sinless body of Christ was beaten. His body was broken to death so that we could have life. Father, thank you for your sinless body 
being torn and broken and abused. Father, we are full of sin, but Lord, we know that you paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup. He just said that this wine represents the body, re- represents the blood of Christ that's going to be poured out to cover the sins of humanity. Used to, we had to bring in our, our animal sacrifices and the priests had to shed their blood and that's what covered the sins of the person bringing in the sacrifice, but no more, we don't have to do that. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice by shedding his blood on the cross. We accept that and we believe, we believe that this weekend. Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing your blood to be shed to cover the sins, to cover my personal sins and the sins of humanity. We receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all drink. That leads us to point number two. Point number two says, the hope of Jesus offers me everlasting life. The hope of Jesus offers me everlasting life. You want a prescription for hopelessness, for despair? It's Jesus. Did you know that one out of every six Americans believe that there is nothing after death? There's no life after death. One out of every six. Can I ask you, where is the hope in that? No wonder so many people walk around with this attitude of feeling hopeless. And because of that, they automatically go to wishful thinking that says, maybe I'll be reincarnated or something when I die. Or or they engage in blind optimism that says, you know what, I just won't think about it. And I'll just live my life. Those defense mechanisms of blind optimism and wishful thinking can make us feel okay for a little while. But there's one really, really ugly statistic in this world that none of us likes facing. And it's this, that death plays a perfect game, that one out of every one will die, 100%. How we face death says a whole lot about how we face life. And when we know that we have a future and eternity with God, then we'll have a sense of confidence and boldness and courage in this world. It turns us from hopeless to hopeful, from hopelessness to hopefulness. I never will forget a story that my wife Janet tells. When she was just a teenager, she had a dream one night of being, uh, she was in the hospital and she was delivering her first baby and with her was her future husband. And she could see everything about this man that was standing there regarding his, his build, his voice, uh, uh, the way that he was standing. Even She could even describe the clothes that he was wearing. Being in the hospital, delivering her baby, she could see everything but His face. She couldn't see his face. And it always drove her crazy to know that she was always trying to figure out, who am I going to marry? Who is this this person standing here with me as I'm delivering our first child? And she and I got married in 1993. And on our second anniversary, November 6, 1995, our first son Caleb was born. And I never will forget her looking at me when we were in, uh, in the hospital room and her looking at me and saying, oh, my gosh. It just kind of hit her. She said, you were the one in the dream. That person that was standing there, my dream that I had all those years ago, delivering a baby, that was you. You ever feel that way with Jesus? Maybe you felt the presence of Christ in your life. You've experienced his comfort when you faced hurts and tough times and tragedy. You've sensed him leading you and guiding you through decisions and situations. He's been so real to you in all these ways, but you can't see his face. It's not all completely clear, but you want to see his face. Well, here's some hope that I want you to really grab a hold of this weekend. I know someday... I know someday I have the confident expectation that one of the promises I have, that one of these days I'm going to be with the Father and I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I know that. That is a confident hope. 
And personally, I can hardly wait until then. There's, not, there, there's going to be nothing like that moment when we first see Jesus. Death is not something to be afraid of when you know your future. So as we draw to a close this Christmas, as we come closer into the holiday season, the Christmas season, let me ask, is it going to be just wishful thinking for you? Is it going to be blind optimism for you? Or is it going to be living in true, confident hope that Christ can be the hope for you in this world? Is it going to be uncertainty of the future or knowing that you're going to see his face someday? Do you really want to spend another day, another year uncertain of your future? I don't believe you do. So what do we do? In Titus, continuing on in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, it says this. He saved us, not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins and gave us a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, did. He declared us not guilty because of his great kindness. And now we know that we will inherit eternal life. I want to give you a chance to enter into this season living in hope because of what Christ has done. Not only has he done, but what he will do. What he can do and what he will do. We've called this series the hope of the world because it's not just about celebrating Christmas, but about turning to the who behind Christmas. Letting Christ shine through us so that people can see him in our daily lives. Imagine people catching the vision of hope. Imagine people watching and catching our, our, our sense of being hopeful in life. Because the hope of Jesus lives in and through us this year. No matter where you're at. Whether you're watching me or whether you're listening to me. I want you to bow your heads this weekend. I want to pray that you will receive the hope of Jesus Christ in your life before we go into the holiday season. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, for many this season can seem hopeless when we reflect back on 2020 and we reflect on how crazy this year has been, Father, I know just from personal conversations that I've had with people, there's there's a lot of people who are still hurting. You know exactly who they are. They're hurting mentally. They're hurting emotionally. They're hurting financially. They're hurting relationally. Father, that's the number one area that, that, that that I've that I've seen, Lord, not only in my own community, Lord, but around this country. There is a relational fatigue. Not because we've had too much of it, Lord, but because of the lack of it. Father, which has created a sense of hopelessness, Lord, in our country. Father, as we engage and go into this season, Lord, I pray that this sense of being hopeful, which is who you are, will penetrate our lives, will penetrate our homes, penetrate our churches, penetrate our daily uh, communication and conversations with you, Lord. That in the middle of this crazy storm that we're in culturally, Lord, you are right in the middle and you are peace. You are hope. Father, let us see that. Let us sense that. Let us grab a hold of that. Let us own that this weekend, Father, that you are hope. We turn to you, the hope of the world. We know that greater things are coming if we just trust you, if we just surrender to you. And that's what we do this weekend in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Hey, thank you for joining us on, as we kick off this, uh, this series about Jesus being the hope of the world. I'm looking forward to getting into the rest of the messages. Don't forget everything that we talked about earlier, all the resources and texting prayers. And lastly, we just want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness in your giving, okay, because we cannot do it without you. Whether you uh, uh, mail that in or whether you uh, go online and you do it through the website or through the app, we could not do what we do without you. It is a heart condition. It is a heart condition, and let me just encourage you, let me challenge you not to forget what the Lord has done. All the blessings that you have in your life is because of him, and all he is asking from us is a portion or percentage to surrender and trust him, to, to trust that back to him. So just want to encourage you to do that, challenge you to do that, make sure that you stay connected with New Life, however you choose to do that. We love you guys. We're praying for you. We'll see you next weekend.